The Oracle Network. You want to play games, motherfucker? Welcome to another episode of Once Upon a Nightmare. I'm, of course, your host, Lorraine Purden, and I'm here with just another horror film this week because I messed up the one I was supposed to be doing, and I wrote this a few months ago, so I thought I'd throw this one in there instead, and that is a film from 2021 with spoilers. This is Spiral from the Book of Saw. What do you got there? Oh, it's just my wife, Emma. This is my son, Charlie. Enjoy it while it lasts. While it lasts? Nothing happier than the wife of a new detective. Emma's cool, man. She's different. You don't know my wife. You can give a woman 600 Tuesdays. It ain't worth three Saturday nights. How much money you got? A lot. How many problems you got? A lot. How many people have doubted? A lot. All available right, units. Right, right, officer right, down. I'm afraid that you flop. Detective Banks and route. did this has another motive. They're targeting cops. This shit's gonna go sideways fast. Someone's out there pulling all the strings. You want to play games, motherfucker? Spiral was written by Josh Stolberg and Pete Goldfinger, who also wrote Jigsaw and was directed by Darren Lynn Boosman. It stars Chris Rock as Detective Zeke Banks, a good cop trying to hunt down the latest copycat serial killer while dealing with some dodgy cops. He is joined against his will by a young detective, William Schneck, who is played by Max Minghella. The young detective almost idolizes Banks along with his father, Marcus, a retired chief played by Samuel L. Jackson. I really said chef then. Boosman is no stranger to the Saw franchise, having directed two, three, and four, but it was a passion project for Chris Rock. He really wanted to be involved. And the idea for the film came from Rock. You know, we know him as a comedian in certain roles, and this wouldn't have been what I had, would put him as. He said he had to convince um, veteran Saw producers Mark Berg and Oren Cools that his idea wasn't to make another, like, scary movie film. He said, a lot of the meeting was convincing them that I didn't want to make scary movie. I didn't want to make a broad comedy. I thought something more like 48 hours where you could get laughs and be scared at the same time. And they kind of went for it. So here we are. Rock then submitted a treatment and he actually did pick Minghella himself as his partner. And I think that was a really good job because they did have great chemistry. But unfortunately, the film, it did get quite a few low stars. It wasn't really that well received. It's all... It's not my favorite franchise, but I do, the films I have seen, I do like, I think I've seen one, two, and three, but I'd need to go back to two and three and I need to watch the rest because I only really remember the first one because I watched that one quite recently. Spiral is actually the ninth movie though of the Saw franchise. And, you know, like I said, Chris Rock, horror doesn't jump to mind when we think of that him in film, but he actually made this film for me. He's a character that pretty much hates everyone. and he doesn't want to play dirty. He doesn't want to follow the other guys and their corrupt ways. He called out a dodgy cop and he's paying the price for that every single day. No one wants to work with him and he can trust no one. It's just so crazy, isn't it? The dirty cop commits this heinous crime and he's the one that pays for it just because he told on him. You know, it's given him a mark on his back, um, which is ironic, isn't it? You do the right thing in the police force and all eyes are on you, but for the wrong reason. But this just makes you, you know, more on Zeke's side. You feel for him, you root for him, and you basically want him to come out on top from the moment you meet him. So we have someone 
that we're following throughout this film. It starts off in a really um, usual, brutal, saw-esque way. And yeah, you, you know, you have to turn away and hide your eyes. Well, you know, I do because I'm such a wuss. But if you, I think if you can look at what this, what happens to this guy and it doesn't make you turn away, like seriously, what is going on? Like most of the Saw characters, you, have subjected, you are subjected to these torturous ways to die. And let's face it, it's a bit of an overreaction the way people are killed. Yes, people sometimes could do with some form of punishment, but not in the brutal way that we see in these films. And I'll be honest, I did pretty much have the killer picked out from the start. And if I was wrong, I did have a backup. But I'm not going to reveal who it is yet. I will as this goes on, just in case you haven't seen it. But yet again, this is a spoiler episode. All my episodes are spoilers. I like to spoil things, but I do tell you. Do I tell you and everything? I don't know. So how does the first guy go? Pretty much off the bat, we know we are in for some serious brutal gore. The film does not ease you into it with that side of things. Detective Boswick. Um, now, this lad, a bit dodgy. Well, really dodgy. But honestly, his <laughs> it's so brutal. So we see this guy wake up to find himself dangling over this train track in a subway with his tongue is like clamped down. So basically, you know the way you have to do something to survive in this film. So this film... Rip out your tongue to survive, so you fall to the ground. You may, might be able to get off or get smashed by a train and die. I'm no doctor, but I feel like if you ripped out your tongue the way this guy's tongue was ripped out, I, I don't think you'd survive that. But I think one of the little sad things in this situation was why this guy's a dodgy cop. He was actually doing something good when he got himself into this situation. So he was chasing somebody. He like, I think he grabbed a purse or something. So he was chasing a thief. You know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So after this uh, glorious, uh, very creative murder, that's one thing I will say about the Saw films. They, they've got some imagination. So we're back in the precinct and we have Zeke and Chief Captain Angie Garza. And she's played by um, Marissa Nichols. Zeke wants the case. And I have to admit, I do, I do love the language that we're about to hear in this film. And... You know, I, I sometimes wish people would speak like that in general. I know it's not for everyone, but it's, it, it doesn't really bother me. I find it's a lot of swearing, a lot of swearing. I find I find it quite freeing sometimes to swear. And it's something, like I said, it's never bothered me. Plus, I grew up in Ireland, so you wouldn't want to be sensitive to swearing over there. And, you know, it was very much a thing where even the teacher swore over there, whereas I never had that when I was, I kind of half grew up in England and Ireland as a kid. Um, But... I don't know if you've seen the beginning of Beverly Hills Cop, uh, Inspector Todd, who was actually a real chief of police. All that swearing. And I just love it. I just love the way they talk. I love that every other word is F. It, but it has to work. You can't just throw that in anywhere. But in this situation, the environment they're in, it really works. And, you know, sometimes you just need a good swear. So Zeke does take the case. And of course, the rest of the cops are not happy. And they show it. Like Zeke to them is a rat. He's a dirty one. He's the dirty one. He's the dirty cop. And, you know, the dirty cop in question that they're talking about, like they're protecting, should I say, was Pete Dunleavy. And he was played by a Patrick McManus and he killed a witness. Charlie Emerson was going to testify against a corrupt cop. And Pete said that this witness just shot him one day. So he he had to do it, you know, of course, to protect himself. And it makes no sense because it was just a routine call. And, you know, they were just seeing, did he recognize someone in the picture? And Zeke obviously copped on to what was going on here. And in the eyes of the force, you should look away. You should never tell on your own. So while we know in this movie, like there's now this killer and it's like a very jigsaw killer, it's not actually jigsaw that's in the movie. But the killer did stick to the same MO as uh, jigsaw, getting together these elaborate and personal ways for people to die while, you know, including still the pig's mass and this puppet that keeps popping up. And as we know with a pig, it's a very derogatory term, derogatory term um, that's used against the police. And people don't trust the police. But to be honest with you, when you watch a film like this, you think, how can we? I know it's just a film, but, you know, I've heard stories. So we do see a lot of, obviously, police corruption these days um, on TV, murders, innocence, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you kind of think to yourself sometimes it's only a matter of time before people have had enough. Like, who polices the police? And in, But in this movie, there's insult added to injury with how the police act as there is actually 
like a law that allows the police to have unlimited power while they're while they're like cleaning up the streets. So we hear this term Article 8 being thrown about. And it's basically a get out of jail free card for dirty cops. Now, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't shed a tear if a child murderer or a rapist was killed on the spot. But the problem with things like this is people that don't deserve it get it. So it's it's kind of used, it's not used how it should be, basically. So Marcus was the one responsible for this. So Samuel Jackson's character, he was responsible for this and he allowed the corruption. And the one person, you know, who was his right-hand woman was Angie. She was by his side and knew, she knew how to cover things up. And I think if you're going to have her job in this kind of environment that's in this film, you need to be willing to do that. So I'll be honest though, I didn't see her as a potential victim. I misread her character as someone good, someone not corrupt, but you know, as the film progressed, we soon learned that she's no better than the rest of them. She isn't as bad, but, you know, I'll give her that, but still, she's not as good. But her death, you know, well, I suppose like all of them, it's pretty brutal. And I feel like though hers lasted quite a while, like she had her spine severed and then she's like lying there with all this wax slowly burning off her face, basically. Um, So she could sever her spine, sorry, or do that. But if you severed your spine, you wouldn't be able to move, would you? I don't think you would. One reason we feel Angie may be good, though, I think, is that she could just be someone... I feel like she got caught up in all the bullshit. That's why I kind of wasn't sure whether I was like, is she good? Is she bad? But I felt like she got caught up in it and she played the game for survival, really. You know, I think she would have been on the straight and narrow if that was the environment she was in. But obviously, that's no excuse. But, you know, oh, it's no excuse at the end of the day. So she wants this killer caught, obviously, especially as the cops are being targeted. And, you know, she's trying to say to people, you have to work with Zeke. You have to listen to him. But they don't take any heed. Um, but she does seem like she's trying. And they're so so caught up in their own emotions that they can't look past it. Even when cops, cops are literally dying here. I mean, they're such a pathetic bunch of losers. So I did feel bad for her re- with regards to that. And, you know, I don't feel she should have been a victim like the others you know, Zeke does cop on to the fact that she is the next victim and does try desperately to save her, but he he doesn't obviously get there in time. And had others not been so quick to dismiss him and ignore him, he may have been able to call another policeman and get them down to her as it was on the actual premises that her death um, happened. So had they not been such assholes, they would have been able to try and get down there and save her. Yes, the killer is the main reason, but they could have helped. When Zeke does find her and tries to, like, he tries to peel this wax off her face, it's actually quite sad because he's trying to give her mouth to mouth, but it's, like, too late. The character was originally supposed to be a man, played by a man, but they changed it to a female because they wanted to cast um, Nichols. And to be honest, you know, she did it really well. And, you know, the cast is very male-heavy, so it was good to have this, like, really strong female character involved. And she was very believable, and I actually really enjoyed her performance. She knew Zeke had to watch himself against this guy called Fitch. So Fitch, he is the main guy who had an issue with Zeke, or at least he's the one who shows it the most. Angie did her best to make like him listen to Zeke, but Fitch, he's not having any of it. And he also is so corrupt himself that he literally was going to let Zeke die, you know? And when he re- he refused to respond to a backup call and Zeke got shot, But for Finch, you know, he took full advantage of Article 8. So I'll be honest, when he actually does go, you don't feel one bit sorry for him. Yes, again, he doesn't really deserve what happens, but he's such a dick. You do not care at all. The likes of him, they deserve to suffer in jail. Um, And you know how much criminals love cops in jail. But these type of ones, I couldn't give less of a toss about. But then again, you know, Finch is so bad to the core, so maybe... Maybe he does deserve it. He killed um, a man he pulled over for simply, like, giving him the finger. He is way too emotional to be a policeman. I think if you're that emotional and you can't control your feelings and you react every, you know, moment that it goes, then you're the worst kind of cop. And you really, that really is not the profession for you. You should not be given a gun when you can, you know, when you're that emotional. But for Fitch, he gets it. He actually gets it before Angie does. And he's placed, like, in this large tub of water and he, I think he rips his fingers off. Um, he has to rip his fingers off to escape or die by electrocution. And while these people are, 
are given away out again. You know, he's not going to be able to do that. I mean, how, how do you rip your... I know he had, like, these devices on, but how do you rip your fingers off? And I suppose it goes against every fibre of your being, doesn't it? Like, there's not that much time given. So the killer knows the chance of them getting out alive is slim. But the thought of ripping off your, you know, your tongue or your fingers... You can't think about that because of the pain and the panic would set in and you wouldn't know what to do. And there's always a chance, there's always that chance, just a bit, that the death may never come and you could survive. So, yeah, I don't know what i do in that situation. So we've lost Boswick, Fitch, Angie. So who's next on this list? Well, the person who kind of started it off, Peter Dunleavy. So his death, his death was particularly brutal. I say that a lot. They're all brutal. It's sore for Frick's sake. And Zeke is there because he's been kidnapped. And I find this whole thing really quite confusing because I'm like, Zeke is a good cop. So why has he been taken? That bit made no sense to me. But, you know, it's a serial killer. They don't really make much sense, do they? But he manages to um, free himself. And even while all this is going on, like he's been kidnapped, he could get out. He tries to save he tries to save Dunleavy, despite everything that, you know, he's done. He tries to save it, even if that means him getting hurt himself. My God, the plot thickens. Woo. So we see that Zeke, he's like handcuffed to this pipe. So when anyone, but no, he doesn't have to uh, saw his arm off. Luckily, there's a hairpin. Someone's dropped a hairpin and he can free himself. And we see the man hanging, but we don't really know who he is at this stage. And then we see Dunleavy. Um, he, oh, it's such a race against time to get him. Because, like, these shards of broken glass are being flung at his body with speed. And, you know, Zeke's kind of in the line of fire here, but he he still tries. And all that they've been through together, you know, he he still tried. And it shows what a really good cop he is, but uh, he had to let go. The issue with killers like Jigsaw, I suppose, is, you know, or the one here, is they believe they're given some sort of justice, you know? You did this, so you get this. It's such bullshit. I mean, they think they're given some sort of service as to justify in their own heads that this is deserved. You know, they're judge, jury, and executioner, but no one gets to play that role off their own back and use that as a reason to kill. At the end of the day, you're just as sick and twisted, if not more than these people that you're killing because, you know, they're so bad. So who is this sick and twisted killer, I hear you say? Well, I figured it out pretty much for the start. I did, my backup was Marcus, Zeke's dad. And, but then with the whole thing with Angie, that didn't really work. But my first guess was uh, Zeke's new partner, Sheck. And I was right. So to be fair, Sheck had more of a, more of a motive. It was very personal for him. His dad was Charlie Emerson. He was the innocent witness that was shot. So his reasoning, you can understand. I mean, his father's death was a direct result of police corruption, not saying he's right, but, you know, you get his thinking, you can get behind it. He witnessed his dad being killed, but he also witnessed Zeke being a good guy. And he says he's been loyal to Zeke his whole life. And Zeke saw him and gestured for him to keep quiet. He knew his dad was being murdered. And, you know, when Zeke, when Shrek was a, a young boy, like he he saw him. So he was like, look, just make no noise. Because if they had saw, saw him as well, he he would have been killed. So it showed that he wasn't part of it. And, uh, you know, he dobbed in the actual cup it was. So, you know, he's a good guy. I think something that gave it away for me, though, that didn't make sense was his death. So he didn't fit the victimology of the others. He was a good guy and killed again in a brutal manner, if I haven't mentioned that before. Plus, we didn't see him. We didn't see him get killed. It was a lot less attention. There was a little bit, you know, going on here and there. But it is a skinned victim. So he was skinned. And there was some tattoo there that is the same as what he had. But something just didn't sit right, you know? So who was skinned? This was this homeless guy called Benny with a drug problem. And I felt he kind of got caught up in it unfairly. He didn't really deserve it. But the name Charlie was placed on his arm to match uh, Shex. And, you know, for his fake, you know, he, he pretended he had a son called Charlie. So he made up this whole fake family. So this guy, though, Check. this is where you kind of, you know, he's he's completely lost the plot here. And he actually wants Zeke to help him to get more bad cops. Now, Jigsaw, he gets a mention here as he lays out his plan. Jigsaw was more 
more about the individual, whereas Sheck, he wants to go after the institution. He wants to bring down the police, clean up the cops. Nice sentiment, but will you, you know, you never get rid of bad people no matter how many you kill. Evil always finds a way. Evil dies tonight. <laughs> how did I manage to get that in? But throughout the whole film, we do get these little videos of puppets, and it's not kind of clear why. Well, it wasn't to me, but all that would change at the end when it came to Zeke's father. So there is a lot here to do with Jigsaw, but without having Jigsaw. So Marcus has gone and we find him, he's attached to all these tubes that's draining his blood and he looks like a puppet. And I suppose as the one who was the chief who led Article 8, he's some, he was somewhat of a puppet master himself, pulling the strings to let police do what they saw fit, knowing full well that this would be taken advantage of. You know, there are dirty cops out there. Tell them that they can they can do what needs to be done to get the job done, that there's no accountability, then there's no line that can be crossed. And I think everybody needs a boundary. Even if they cross it, they need to be told, no, nope, you crossed the line. So while Zeke frees his father, well, temporarily, Sheck has a chance to kind of like get away. But in true serial killer fashion, you can't simply be freed while Marcus was lowered and may look like he actually was going to get away. Well, a serial killer has other plans. This like SWAT team breaks in. It's like raising him up and the brings up the tubes and he just looks like a puppet. And he then dies and all hell breaks loose. There's guns firing and it kind of like this whole puppet that we see throughout the thing makes a lot of sense. You know, the puppet was Marcus. Marcus was corrupt and would cover up crimes and really didn't give a shit. He did care about Zeke, but while he may not have been the most available father, he did show his anger when Fitch wouldn't help Zeke, meaning he got shot and Marcus then attacked him. But this doesn't make him a good man. You hear serial killers, you know, who are great dads. You know, this guy's a good dad, but, you know, it doesn't make him a good man. Like, hell, Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, was apparently a great dad, according to his son, never even raising his voice, yet he's convicted of murdering 48 women. You can be a good parent and still be as evil as Fuka's yet. Leave that door every day. So while we have no jigsaw, this is very much a saw film. It has its puppets, it has masks, it has traps, it has extremely unpleasant ways to die. It's the message before you want to die, telling you that if you do something truly awful to yourself, then you won't die, but you know you're fucked and you know you're going to die. There's a lot there. There's a lot to unravel. And it has the mystery of who it is. And I pretty much feel like they didn't really try to hide the killer. And I think that's why I got it so quickly. I don't think I was like some sort of uh, Sherlock Holmes there. It was pretty obvious. And I think it gave you that gore factor you used to see him with a saw film. I looked away many, many times. And it must be... It's be quite an interesting film to write, actually, all these Saw films, for that matter. Like, to come up with such extreme ways and contraptions to kill someone and, you know, relate that death to something the killer feels they might have done wrong. And the kills also, given that, you know, smidgen, I mean, smidgen of hope that you might not die. You know, if you do this, you could survive. Uh, but the thing that is needed is near impossible, although not the case in the first one. You know, got to saw that foot off. But it, it would be, <laughs> it'd be interesting to see what ideas were you know that people came up with that they were like no that's just too sick because I'm sure there is some so while it is related to the franchise you may feel it isn't though because we didn't have Jigsaw after all the killer is a copycat and we do love our horror icons so from that perspective I think people may not like it maybe that's why it got such a bad rap because it wasn't actually Jigsaw. You know, we want our Jigsaws and our Michaels and our Freddies and Jasons and stuff like that. Um, I did love Chris Rock. I did think it was great. I thought he was exceptional. He was very believable as a detective. With his uh, comedy background, there were times that was useful and worked. But without being over the top, I think it could have been so easy for him to go to his comedy side with how he spoke. But if you never knew who he was, you would think that this is, was the type of role that he did. Samuel L. Jackson gives us his usual star power. And, you know, while he is his usual great self, I do think this is Rock's movie. You know, there are no characters apart from Zeke to really root for. And he he really ensures that you do that. It is, of course, left open as the killer gets away. But let's face it, when it comes to the horror franchise, the death of a killer doesn't really mean much. They always find a way to bring them back. You know, I'll watch it if they do do another. In fact, I'm going to, like I said, watch the whole franchise again. Well, you know, some again, but oh, some for the first time. And yes, I will be covering my eyes. So if you can just go into this and get that 
Jigsaw isn't there. You could enjoy it, and I hope you do. But yeah, it's just going with an open mind and realize that, okay, this isn't a Saw film. It's, it's a copycat film. Uh, anyway, if you have seen it, let me know your thoughts. I'd love to uh, know what you'll think of it. And uh, I will speak to you next week with my normal type of episode. But thanks for listening. And don't forget to rate and review on iTunes and Podchaser for updates and reviews and behind the scenes. Follow me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, on Twitter as a Nightmare Pod, on Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare. Email onceuponanightmarepod at gmail.com and I will chat to you again soon. Bye-bye.